my whole my whole problem and issue was taking up with Richie from San Diego, who was there at the time. Um, he was there. He was a, a MM member, and so was a Tonito. Who was on C yard. Uh, this was Calipat B yard. So it, it's a trip because when you show up somewhere and, and you have, you know, a, a, a scar on your record, or you have an issue, you know, with your time, everybody just basically stays away. So for three months, as, as my case was being reviewed, uh, I was just basically ostracized. I was outcasted. Nobody really wanted to come around me. Even my own homeboys from Bakersfield didn't want to be around me. They would come by, shake my hand, and say hi, and give you those fake smiles, and you know. But they would keep pushing. They'd be like, hey, we have something to go do. We have something to go, you know. Nobody really wanted to be around me because nobody wanted to be around when when it's a fan, basically when I got stabbed again. And I knew I knew that that was a possibility. I knew that was a possibility. But I also believed that I was in the wrong. I, I was in the right. You know, I did nothing wrong. I, I didn't tell on anybody. You know, uh, my paperwork was good. I was there for murder. So I felt that I was in the right. Well, little did I know, the three months that I was there and kind of off on my own and working out by myself and doing my own program by myself, um, Chavo from Bakersfield was calling Calipat and was trying to get me hit again and again and again because he placed my name on a hit list on, on the paper that, that goes around basically the bad news list. Um, Richie from San Diego was there at the time. And he, for some reason, defended me and was like, hey, well, this dude's been hit already. He's been stabbed. He, he kind of basically paid his debt to you in blood already. You know, why? What's what's the big deal about hitting him again and again? Um, later on, I found out that, you know, Chavo was, was trying to push the issue and, and show that he still had authority. And he still had, uh, he was still somebody because you got to remember, these guys are coming out of Pelican Bay, so they still held their authority. It, it was, you know, a, a pissing contest, basically. So, Richie from San Diego tells Travel no for three months. No, no, no. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with this later some other time. Well, after about three months, this was 2016, is when Donito on Sea gets killed. He's a, he's a MM member. He gets killed. That night that he gets killed, um, I, the IGI comes and rushes and, and snaps up Richie, which was basically the only the only man who could tell Chavo no and not to have me hit. That basically was my protection. They come and snatch him up. They take him to Salinas Valley. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. So basically overnight, there went my protection. <laughs> there went the only thing stopping basically the whole yard from stabbing me again. <laughs> all, all in the words of, of one man, you know? And it, it's a it's a, it's a a balance, you know, every day waking up knowing that, hey, today might be the day that you get stabbed and you get murdered and you get killed. Um, so right away, as soon as he left the yard and there was nobody else there to tell somebody no and, and to refuse that, that stabbing, um, within a couple of days, I, I was hit again. Uh, I was on B yard, uh, on in the workout area, waiting for my canteen. It was canteen day. I was really, really happy because I had a hundred dollars on my on my books, and I was really happy about getting me some canteen. Um, to me, that's a lot of money, especially in canteen here in prison. Um, I was really, really happy. I was so happy that as I was waiting for canteen, I was out working out, doing push-ups. Um, and that's when I was uh, that's when I was hit. Uh, it's funny when you get stabbed in prison. These guys, the the, the shooters and, and the guys that are going to get you, they stand far enough away to make you feel comfortable. I mean, that's their job. Their job is to stay far enough away to make you feel comfortable, to to let you not feel threatened or in, in danger or anything. You know, you have to feel comfortable. So, as I went down and and I was. Uh, working on some push-ups. I was hitting sets of 20s. But I went down and started uh, about my 10th push-up is when they jumped on me. Now, I don't remember the, the the dude that was on my right because he was just a medium-sized dude. But I remember the guy on my left. And I remember him because his name was Grande from Compton. 
I remember him because he was a big Mexican. He was a big, healthy, good-sized Mexican. He was about six foot one, maybe, and healthy, in shape. And I remember seeing on the yard when you first hit a yard, you're you're, you're threat assessing the whole yard. And he was one of the guys I noted, and I kept in my mind like, okay, I got to watch for this guy because he's a big dude. You know, if I have to fight him or or go at it with him, this might be a struggle. This might be this might be a real good fight here. You know, he just might get the better of me. And that's what everybody does when they come to prison. You start seeing who's who, where's where, what's what, you know. Uh, so I remember him for some reason. The, the second guy I do not remember, well, that was that was Grande. Grande had, his, he had a knife in his left hand. The other guy was on my right side. He had a knife in his right hand. So immediately they jump on me, jump on top of me and hold me down, which wasn't hard because I was in the push-up position. And I start getting stabbed in my neck, my head, um, my back, of course, my arms, um, ribs. So uh, I'm, I'm trying my best to, to buck him off like a horse. Like, and, and the dude's name Grande for a reason. He's pretty big. Um, I did my best, you know, but I could feel the, the, the instead of punches, I, I'm feeling these, these, you know, they're knives. I'm getting stabbed. So I'm, I'm trying to hide my face as best as possible. I'm trying not to get hit in the eye. That's the worst spot you want. really want to get hit. I'm also trying to protect my, my, my heart. Everyone knows, you know, just, you get your heart hit, that's it. That's game over right there. You know, that, that is it. You're not fighting any more fights. And I've been through this before. This is my second time getting stabbed within the matter of, you know, about eight months. So within the year. So I'm like, okay, I need to do this. You know, I need to, you're, you're fighting for your life. This, it's what you're doing. Um, finally, I, I, I buck them off. I get up, throw a couple punches. By then, the alarm in the prison is going out, going down. Um, the the seals come rushing in to the to the little workout area. These guys throw their knives and prone out. Well, there was a knife that landed about maybe two feet in front of me, and I contemplated. I seen it and contemplated picking it up and fighting and and, and basically getting my run back and getting mine back. You know, hey, you stabbed me, I want to stab you. That's that warrior spirit, that's that That's that fighter in you that you want to fight, you know, especially with all the, the adrenaline running and rushing, you know, throughout your body. But also when I looked at the knife, I also noticed I had a lot of blood dripping down. I mean, this was a lot of blood, you know, a, a whole lot. It was too much, to, it, it was so much that I realized, like, hey, you know what, I need medical attention, I need help. You know what, if I pick up this knife and fight, one, these cops are going to spray us with pepper spray. But also, I may not make it, and I may lose energy, and, and I'm losing blood as I'm fighting anyways. So I did. I chose not to pick it up. I kind of kneeled down and just waited. And uh, I remember the seal coming up to me and putting handcuffs on me, because you have to be handcuffed. He puts handcuffs on me, and he tells me, hey, man, don't move. The back of your neck and the back of your head looks like ground beef <laughs> and I, I remember those I remember those words but finally the adrenaline started uh, slowing down because I was trying to breathe and again this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded and again I noticed that it was hard for me to catch my breath so I, I, I realized I was like okay my lungs are punctured again this time it was a little bit harder it was almost like I was drowning I couldn't catch a breath I kept trying, kept trying. I could not catch breath. Finally, an ambulance comes, picks me up. They throw me on a stretcher, and they take me to the infirmary. And they and, and I got these nurses and these, these RNs working on me, um, basically trying to patch up all these holes I have in me. I, I, I was looking like Swiss cheese, Swiss cheese. They're trying to clean up the blood, patch up the holes. This whole time, it seemed like forever, but it was only a matter of minutes. I'm trying to catch my breath, and I remember being a, having an oxygen mask put over my face, and the CO just standing there and looking at me and watching me, and the face, the, the face that he had, the, the, the look on his face was just like he, he really didn't care, and immediately I thought of that, uh, I, immediately I thought, you know, hey, I can't, uh, you know, I, I might die, you know, I might die, you know, um, and immediately I thought of 
my mom, and I thought of my son. How I didn't get to say goodbye to him. No, no, I have life in prison. I'm serving a term for life in prison, but, and I know I'm going to die in prison, but it's how you die in prison is, is what everybody should be able to control. And I just kept thinking about how I didn't tell my people, my family, my kids, um, how much I really love them and how much they mean to me. And that was the last thing that I saw because the whole world just went blank. It, it's not like I fainted or I felt it coming. My, my, it just, everything just went blank. Now, I had no concept of time because the next thing I know, my eyes opened and I was in a hospital bed in the hospital. And I was looking around um, and I see two COs sitting on chairs at the feet of my bed. And I look, I see my feet, and my feet are, uh, I'm, I'm shackled down to the bed. And uh, one CO just happens to look back and see me, and he's like, hey, guess who's awake? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm collecting my thoughts, and I'm like, okay. Um, he goes, hey, you know where you're at? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know where I'm at. You know, I'm, in, I'm in a hospital. He goes, yeah. He goes, do you know how long you've been here? And I'm like, no, how long? And he says, well, you've been here three days, man. And I, it, it, that just, it hit me. I was like, whoa, three days. Just then, as I tried to speak, my voice left me. And I was like, hey, you know, it got real raspy. I'm like, hey, you know, where's where's my, uh, what's wrong with my voice? What's wrong with my throat? It was it was real just sore. And the CEO was like, hey, uh, yeah, well, they just finished pulling a ventilator out from your throat, dude. And I'm like, Okay, and I'm sitting there trying to talk, and I, my voice was so raspy, it was so low, I just couldn't really talk. They're like, hey, just sit tight. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. They're like, sit tight, we're going to call a, a nurse in here. The nurse comes in, and uh, they're like, yeah, this is the ICU, man. You, you know, we just took the ventilator out of you. How do you feel? Are you in any pain? As soon as the nurse said that, my instantly my whole body hurt it, it's, it's it's a trip how that happened as soon as she mentioned it hey are you in any pain my whole body hurt and i felt it and i was like yes she's like okay well let me get you something for the pain and my whole body just hurt that's when i realized i had these two big like garden hoses coming out of my chest they were coming out of my lungs and I'm looking, and, and of course they hurt, and it was sore, and I'm like, you know, what's this with my raspy voice? What's this? And they're like, well, you, they punctured your lungs. You got your lungs punctured, man. Uh, those are helping drain all the fluids from your lungs. So I'm like, oh, man, I, it just, and it hurt instantly. I was like, whoa. So I moved from the ICU upstairs to my own room. The nurse, same nurse tells me, she's like, yeah, I knew you'd wake up. You have a strong heart. You're a fighter. I'm like, and I'm laughing like a fighter. She goes, yeah. She goes, we know because every time we kept trying to put a catheter in you, you would pull it out and you'd fight us, <laughs> which I thought was really funny. I was like, well, I think anybody would do that. <laughs> so I stayed in the hospital about two weeks. Um, I had two punctured lungs. I had scars and staples on the back of my head, neck, um, I had to get an MRI and uh, all kinds of tests run on me because my spinal cord was hit, but it wasn't damaged. And I had all these uh, scars on my neck, and I still do to this day, but no, no vein, no main vein was punctured, which is surprising. Um, so I stayed in the hospital about two weeks. Um, <laughs> When I'm there, one of the nurses comes in about, about three or four days and takes the left side garden hose out of my lung. And they're like, okay, you're, you're, it, it's reinflated, it, it's looking good, we're going to pull it out. He's like, hey, just to let you know, you know, when I pull this out, it's going to hurt. And I'm like, what do you mean? How, how much is in there? He said, there's about six inches of tubing inside your lungs right now. I'm like, whoa, six inches? He's like, yeah. He's like, I'm, I was like, is it going to hurt? He said, look, it's going to hurt. I'm not going to lie to you. It's going to hurt. When I pull it out, it's going to hurt. He said, but just be glad you're not awake when it was put in. <laughs> so uh, the muscular RN male nurse pulled it out, 
it did hurt. It hurt. Um, but uh, the second one, I was like, well, what about the second one on my uh, left side, left side of my body? My left side lung wouldn't reinflate. Um, so I had to have surgery on it because it was so much, there was so much blood and fluid inside there that the doctor had to perform surgery, go inside my lung, clean it out, clean it out and repair it so that it would reinflate, which is why I stayed in the hospital for two weeks. Uh, the CEOs didn't like that because, of course, the bill's going to CDC. Um, and I, it was just a hell of a, it was a hell of a, hell of a ride at the hospital. Uh, one point, a doctor came in. This is a, this is in Palm Springs Hospital. This is Desert Regional Palm Springs. Uh, really great food. Um, they had a doctor come in, and he was uh, instructing the RN about changing my bandages around my garden hose coming out of my lungs. And uh, at one point, she was trying to show the nurse how to change my bandage. And her her hand slipped, and she actually punched me in my, in my lung. And I felt it, of course, and I'm like, ooh, ah, oh, you know, because it hurt, of course. And immediately right after, she's like, uh, she's like, hey, get this guy some pain pills. And it was funny because the RN was like, uh, we just gave him some Demerol. She's like, well, give him another dose. <laughs> it was funny. It was really funny because uh, at least she made up for kind of punching me in my rib as she was changing the bandage, instructing the RN on how to change my bandage. Uh, that was a funny, funny story right there. Uh, I finally make it back to the hospital, um, back to the prison, and I stayed in the infirmary for another two weeks because I, I contracted pneumonia at the hospital. And it was barely caught on my x-rays. So I'm in the hospital, I'm in the infirmary, and in the infirmary, you're, we're allowed to use the phones. Um, so I got a phone call. Basically, I've been gone a whole month. I was two weeks in Desert, in desert Regional Hospital, and I'm in the infirmary. Uh, by the time I got to use the phone, it was about maybe a week and a half. So I've been gone, you know, over three weeks. And I immediately wanted to call my mom. I immediately wanted to talk to my kids and let her know and my kids know how much I love them, how much I miss them, you know, just in case, you know, I, that, that's all I could really think about was, hey, you know, I love my family, and, and the people that really matter to me, they need to know how much I really love them, how much I really care for them. Um, because my my whole gang lifestyle and prison life, it's, it's the people that have been there the most that you forget so easily. And I felt the shame. And I felt sad that I could forget the people that care about me so much, so fast. So I call my mom, and I call her, and, and she's like, hey, because I, I usually write her every week. She's like, hey, you know, where have you been at, and how come you haven't been writing? So, of course, I lied to her, and I, I it, it hurt to lie, but I also didn't want to let, I didn't want her to worry. So I said, hey, um, I told her a half, a half truth. I'm like, hey, I contracted pneumonia, so I was in the hospital for a little while, which was half true. Um, it wasn't the whole truth, but immediately uh, I was like, hey, can you call my kids? Can you call my son? You know, can you, you know, call my daughter, let them know that I love them very much? Of course she said yes. You know, that's those are her grandkids. Um, but I know she could tell that I wasn't really completely honest. Um, it took me a long time. I, I When I went to the hospital the day I got stabbed, I weighed about 185 pounds. I was pretty healthy, worked out a lot. In the infirmary, when I had my weight taken, I was 150, 150 pounds. So along the way, I lost about a good, you know, 30 pounds somewhere. Uh, I know it was in fluids. I know it was in muscle. Uh, I came back to the doctor immediately said, hey, you're going to have limited mobility in your arm and in your shoulder. Um, it looks like it looks like a like a chicken wing. My chicken wing has popped out. I had a, a, a broken um, clavicle, broken clavicle from trying to buck these heavy, uh, these heavy dudes off my back all the while getting stabbed. Um, when I came back, I immediately, you know, knew 
I need my hospital. I was contemplating, like, hey, look, you know what? I can't be living this gang lifestyle anymore. I can't be playing these prison politics, you know. This is real life, you know. This is, this is life and death, you know. I can't be doing this anymore. I can't run the risk of letting my family and the people that love and care for me lose, you know, lose me and, and me not saying goodbye to them anymore. Um, at that point, I knew that I had to go and, and, and live in protective custody. Here in prison, they call it the uh, S&Y yard, the sensitive needs yard. Um, I dropped out of the gang lifestyle. I, uh, I wanted to live a, 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 a normal, healthy, and happy life, which is what I'm trying to live today, a peaceful life, one without drama and, and uh, always watching your back, always trying to... Uh, you know, I was living that, that life, you know, carrying a knife, you know, um, that just the whole, whole just messy lifestyle. Um, that was 2016. That's, it's been four years now, four years now. And every day I still wake up hurting my back, my neck, my shoulder blades, um, I was stabbed in the cheek, I was stabbed in the neck. Um, I don't know how, you know, but I'm still alive today. Today I'm thankful for my life. Um, I appreciate the people that have ever showed love to me and uh, basically care for me. You know, the people that are still with me, even though with my lifestyle parole sentence, you know, deserve all the credit. Even though. I put through, I put them through so much, you know, they're the people that I live for today.